How do demons in the book of Acts prove that the Holy Spirit is a person? In this video, you'll find out. In our last video, we laid out Jesus' description of the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John from chapters 14 through 16, and that without question, he was clearly speaking about a person and not just some projected force that the Jehovah Witnesses try to claim. The whole point that Jesus was trying to get across to the apostles was that they shouldn't worry about his upcoming departure because he was going to send somebody, a comforter, to guide them and support them as they began their, their ministry. This was done 50 days after Christ's crucifixion on the day of Pentecost, which is celebrated today as the birth of the church. When we lay out the book of Acts, 17 of the 28 chapters have the Holy Spirit directly referred to him in there. Altogether, there are 56 references to the Holy Spirit that can be found in the New World Translation, and when you track all the other references to spirits, or pneumas, in Acts, you will see that there are 14 other verses where spirit is applied to a different individual, but never to a general force or wind. Altogether, there are 70 references to spirit to track on in the book of Acts. If we were trying to figure out if somebody existed from the past, one of the determinants would be as if they were ever recorded talking or quoted. Well, this is exactly what we have with the Holy Spirit in Acts four times. And I don't mean generically, I mean the Holy Spirit said blah 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 with quotation marks around the statement. Looking at the first. And Philip arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was over all her treasure, who had come to Jerusalem to worship. And the eunuch was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran to the eunuch. Look at the relationship here. The spirit gave a command to Philip and he obeyed the spirit. Next in 10, 19 through 20. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius. Do you see the three things that the Spirit did here? He's obviously talking to Peter, and gave commands to Peter, but even declared that he was the one who brought Cornelius' servants to him. And what was Peter's reaction? He obeyed. Next in 13.2. Now there were at Antioch, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Mananin, the foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord, and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia. Two things to notice here. First is that all five men are explained as hearing the same thing in the same moment. Next, the Holy Spirit said, He has called Paul and Barnabas. So now we have the Holy Spirit picking and choosing whom he wishes to call into specific work. There is only one being ever described doing such a thing in the whole Bible. And the final one in 12, 21, 11. And as we tarried there some days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And coming to us and taking Paul's girdle, he bound his feet, his own feet, and hands, and said, Thus saith the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owns this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So we have Agabus giving a prophecy about Paul to Paul and others, but he said, Thus saith the Holy Spirit. So this statement is really coming straight from the Holy Spirit. He didn't say, Thus saith Jehovah or the Lord, like every other single Old Testament prophet did. He said, the Holy Spirit saith this. But we all know that the catch here is that only God can give prophecies like this. So how could anyone ever walk away from these four quotes and not attribute personhood to the Holy Spirit? Or think that Luke wasn't actually describing an actual person? 
Acts is a historical book, not poetry, so you can't just slap personification on as in a form of an excuse. Or how about this? What if these verses read like this? Would you ever say that this character isn't talking as a person? Of course not. So be consistent with your hermeneutics. When the plain sense of scripture makes common sense, no other sense is needed. As we noted earlier, there are 14 other references to spirit in the book of Acts other than the Holy Spirit, 10 of which are described as unclean, wicked, or evil spirits, better known as demons. The four passages that we'll be looking surround verses 5, 16, 8, 7, 16, 16 through 18, and 19, 15 through 16. For our purpose today, we'll be taking the first shall be last and the last shall be first approach, starting in 1911. And God did special miracles by the hands of Paul, twelve insomuch that unto the sick were carried away from his body cloths or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out. But certain also of the strolling or itinerant Jews, exorcists, took upon them to name over them that had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, a chief priest, who did this. And the evil spirit answered and said unto them, the Jews, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and mastered both of them and prevailed against him, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. A few observational points here about the evil spirits is that first, we see that the spirit is inside the man, that he can talk directly using the man, and also gave supernatural strength, or we could say abilities, to the man. The supernatural strength is similar to when Jesus encountered the Gasserine demoniac, where the man had such enhanced strength to be able to rip chains apart and break his shackles into pieces. And in Luke 4, Jesus meets another man with an unclean spirit, and it says, And in the synagogue there was a man that had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ah, what have we to do with thee, Jesus thou Nazarene? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Now look at Jesus' reply. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst, he came out of him, having done him no hurt. Looking at both contexts beside each other, we have a man possessed by an evil spirit, where Luke records the spirit talking. So from both of these, and Mark's account of Jesus even asking the demoniac, What is your name? Here's what you ask. Is Jesus just talking to the man? Or is he talking to the spiritual person inside the man? They would have to say the demon. So are evil spirits persons then? Yes. Okay. So when Luke recorded the Holy Spirit talking through Agabus in 2111, and we see the same details as with 1915 through 16, then why shouldn't we consider the Holy Spirit a person using the same method of interpretation? See the inconsistency here at play with the Watchtower? Another thing to notice within the demon verses of Acts is that Luke always mentions the Holy Spirit close by. Just before this in 19.6, it reads, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Again, notice the similar details. The Holy Spirit is inside the men. Notice that this is plural, meaning that the Holy Spirit can be in multiple places at the same time, displaying his omnipresence. The Spirit spoke through the men also and gave them supernatural abilities by speaking in tongues and prophecy. Our next scene is in chapter 16, verses 16 through 18. And it came to pass, as we were going to the place of prayer, that a certain maid had a spirit of divination that, that met us, who brought her masters much gain by soothsaying or fortune telling. The same following after Paul, and us cried out, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim unto you the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, being sore troubled, turned and said to the Spirit, 
I charge thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out of her that very hour. One observation that you should make about all the verses on casting out or rebuking demons in the New Testament is that Jesus never appealed to a higher authority while everyone else had to, including Michael the Archangel in Jude 9. So we see this evil spirit is called a spirit of divination. The spirit was inside the slave girl, talked through the girl, and gave prophecy to the girl in the form of fortune telling for her business. And another subtle detail here is that Paul clearly heard and recognized the evil spirit talking from the girl. Again, comparing this with the Holy Spirit speaking through Agabus to Paul, Paul knew that he was hearing the Holy Spirit talking just like he heard the evil spirit talking from the slave girl. Same question still applies here as well. Now looking for a close by reference to the Holy Spirit, we find him again just before this starting in verse 6. And Paul and Timothy went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden of the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. It's kind of hard to be forbidden to do something, unless the one forbidding is actually a person. And when they came over against Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus suffered them not. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. Yes, it says the Spirit of Jesus in the New World Translation, and yes, it's a big deal. Lining up both passages beside each other, first we see Paul in both scenes, and both describe Paul as being a servant because he is a servant to the Holy Spirit on the left and the Most High God on the right. Always take notice of the reflexive nature implied in the text. Paul was clearly hearing and responding to both spirits. And the last similarity is that the Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of Jesus and the evil spirit is also called the Spirit of Divination. Same question again. Our next demon mentioning is in chapter 8, verses 5 through 7, right after Stephen was martyred and the Sanhedrin started to persecute the church and led to everyone spreading out. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed unto them the Christ. For from many of those that had unclean spirits, they came out crying with a loud voice. A simple thing to notice here, like in all other scenes, is that the evil spirits are clearly talking even when they're not even indwelling the people. The Holy Spirit is close by in the, in the text and is one of the quotes we heard earlier when he commanded Philip to go and join the Ethiopian eutych. In both cases, we have Philip hearing the evil spirit and the Holy Spirit talking. One supreme difference here is that Philip is commanded by the Holy Spirit, whereas he can command the evil spirits to come out. This is no different when Jesus sent out the 70 in Luke 10 and they came back rejoicing because even the demons obeyed them by the authority of Jesus. Our last scene, which is really the first scene of demons in Acts, is in 516. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. There came also a multitude of the cities round about unto Jerusalem bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one of them. The word vexed here means to be possessed, troubled, and even tormented. Either way, the apostles were casting them out just like all the other references. To find our nearby Holy Spirit reference, all we need to do is just go right back to the beginning of chapter 5 to a story that should be fairly familiar to us. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. We understand this scene to be when the apostles and many believers had to start living communally outside of Jerusalem following Pentecost. But Ananias and Sapphira were a little deceptive with their giving to the community pot. And in comes Peter. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, and to keep back part of the price of the land? The contrast that Luke lays out here is that we saw the demons tormenting people earlier and made them do wicked things, which includes lying to the Holy Spirit. 
But the indwelling of the Holy Spirit emboldens people that you read just before this in 431. So evil spirits torment people, while the Holy Spirit gives boldness and strength to do what is right, which even includes calling out people publicly. So how does all this prove that the Holy Spirit is God? Well first, the Holy Spirit is clearly a spiritual person, just like the demons and angels are. Second, we could simply say that since only God is eternal, and that the Holy Spirit is described as eternal in Hebrews 9.14, that the logical extension of this would be that the Holy Spirit is God. But since logic is hard to come by these days, how about a verse that says that the Holy Spirit is God? Going right back to Peter with Ananias and Sapphira, where Peter said that Ananias had lied to the Holy Spirit, but Peter wasn't done chewing him out just quite then. Verse 4, While it remained, did it not remain thy own? And after it was sold, was it not in thy power? How is it that thou hast conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Did you catch that? Look at the highlighted portion in verse 4. Peter said Ananias lied to God. He first said to Ananias that he lied to the Holy Spirit in verse 3, and then doubled down on that statement by saying that he lied to God in verse 4. This is Peter calling the Holy Spirit God. Is that really in the New World Translation? Yes! Just find their online Bible, go to Acts 5, and scroll down, and there you can read it. Verse 3, why has Satan emboldened you to lie to the Holy Spirit? And down in verse 4, you have lied, not to men, but to God. But, 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 no buts. Just look and listen for once. This is the exact same textual application that Luke did in chapter 16. You see the verb action mentioned twice in each context, Ananias lying on the left and Paul being forbidden on the right. And you see how the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Jesus on the right, which is done in the same manner on the left side with the Holy Spirit now being called God. Thus, the Holy Spirit is God, which is the Spirit of Jesus. You see. Us Trinitarians aren't just believing some lie implanted by Constantine and pagans in the 4th century, or stumbling on some preschool math problem if 3 equals 1 or not. This is what the Bible declares. We understand and totally believe that there is one eternal, uncreated, almighty deity known as Yahweh, and yes we know the monotheistic verses that go with this, they're in every church's statement of faith, but when we also take into account the totality of scripture, we recognize that there are three different persons that are being described with the same descriptions of being eternal, uncreated, and even called God directly, and that is why we say that there is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But yet again, when we take into account all of Scripture and the relationship that we see between these three persons, that we see that they have the same essence, but they are distinct from one another, including their role and rank. And that is why we declare that there is one God in three divine persons, which is why Jesus told us to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He was telling the apostles that they had the authority by God to baptize people into the family of God, thus becoming temples of God by having God, the Holy Spirit, living inside us permanently. Reminder to hit the subscribe button, turn on the notification bell, hit the like button, and leave a comment. And don't forget to look in the description below for the link for the handout so you'll always be ready when they come knocking at the door. In the meantime, stay salty.